been a really big welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And thanks for coming out first thing in the morning. So I know that's always a tricky one for me. So I appreciate seeing so many faces in the crowd. Um, so yeah, I can promise no unicorns were harmed in the making of this talk in case there was any concern about that. Um, so yes, I'm Chief Experience Officer at Speed Curve. Um, and it's been, uh, this is where you can, you, can, you can reach me. I also help um, uh, monitor and, uh, and, and aggregate case studies with Tim Cadillac on a site called WPOstats.com. So if you're looking for performance case studies that are actually submitted by um, real companies like you, this is a good place to, to check them out. And if you have a great case study, such as the ones that we've seen so far, we'd love it if you submit it and there's information on how to submit there as well. Um, so, uh, oh, and I wrote a book, so you can get that if you would like. I just thought I would put that there. Um, so it's been an interesting journey. Perry mentioned that I've been studying user experience for two year, or two, two decades. And um, when I first started, kind of in the, the, the wild days of the web, um, building usability test labs where we were lucky to get, you know, a dozen, 20 people into the lab and, and get them to use our, our websites, just sites, no apps, because an app didn't exist then. Um, and over the, over the, the years, uh, really trying to understand users from this sort of ivory tower perspective um, where I was able to actually look at people in lab settings and study them and look at their faces and ask them questions about how they use the web and really interrogate them and give them uh, very specific tasks to, 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 to try to complete to this, where now at Speed Curve, we, we, monitor, we help companies to monitor and measure user experiences um, using uh, synthetic tools and using our RUM tools, our real user monitoring. So going from, again, this actual person to this live data stream of people using a site where you can see all kinds of interesting things like the time and what city they're in and no personally identifying information, of course, but when they first interacted with a page and whether it was through clicking or a keystroke, um, what the page was, everything but the actual person. Um, so it, it, this, this level of abstraction is really fascinating and it's, it's great to have access to so much data, so much, such an unprecedented unprecedented amount of user data, but again, it's not the same as an actual user. Um, and so trying to connect the dots between real people and a, a, a feed of a million, two million, three million um, page views happening per day is very, very tricky. And this is the, the obstacle that I've been um, trying to, to jump over for the past nine or 10 years. Because really the question that we're asking here is, how do you scale empathy? It's really easy to have empathy for one person um, when you're watching them in a lab setting or in the real world or for yourself whenever you're trying to change flights because your flight's been canceled and the airport Wi-Fi is crappy and your phone is about to die and you have a screaming toddler with you. Um, it's really easy to have empathy in those situations, but how do you have empathy for millions or billions of users? Does empathy even scale? And um, how can we remind ourselves that there are real people at the other side of all the data that we look at? Um, I don't have anything. There just hasn't been a unicorn yet in the talk, and we're seven slides in, so I thought I would put this here. Um, so, wh and why do we care? You know, obviously we care because um, because being stressed out by a slow website really sucks. It's, uh, web stress is a real thing. Um, there was a study by CA Technologies uh, many years ago um, where they found that when an app or a website is slow, we have to concentrate up to 50% harder to complete our task. And um, a few years after the CA Technologies study came out, I was actually part of another study where we um, replicated that study, but using mobile users, and we found the same thing. So um, very reproducible um, uh, evidence that regardless of what device people are on, um, when, when our apps or our sites are slow, we, it stresses us out. It's hard. The average web user believes, they believe that they waste two, uh, two days a year waiting for pages to load. 
Um, this is part of a survey. Now, surveys are dubious, obviously. Is, you know, do, does, the actual per, does the average person actually wait two, two days a year for pages to load? Probably not. Um, but they feel that they do. People are aware of delays in page loading as a presence in their lives, this, this massive time suck. Two days out of your 365 days that you're allotted, that's, that's precious life moments you know, that you'll never get back. And we're aware of the fact that we're, we're spending them waiting for things to show up on little screens in our hands. Um, I mean, maybe the exception is, you know, Australian hotel rooms where I took this screenshot of my hotel Wi-Fi, um, where, you know, maybe in Australia you actually do wait um, two days uh, a year for pages to load one megabit per second. I felt like I tra time traveled back to 1997. Um, so slow sites and apps suck for your visitors. They suck for your business. Um, Sorry, Tim yesterday said that he wasn't, uh, he was going to try to refrain from using the word awesome as, as much as possible in his speech and, and peppering it with uh, different North Americanisms. I can't make the same promise, so the word awesome is probably going to come up. Suck already has. I'll try to keep it to a, <laughs> I'll try to keep it to a minimum. Um, and so this is, uh, you look, a, 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 a chart showing the correlation between page render time and, uh, sorry, start render time and bounce rate using real user data. So we know, this is uh, looking at a media site, I won't say which one, um, where even at a slight delay, like at 0.8 seconds um, of start render, bounce rate was 70.7%. So this is a significant thing. You know, this hurts your business, your media site. You care about people staying on your site and not bouncing. And you can see that as pages, as start render time gets slower, people bounce more. And that continues to creep up. And you also see, you know, where you get that delta, where it's people are, you know, really um, more responsive and more likely to stay on the site when start render time is just a little bit faster. So how quickly that bounces off. Um, some case studies, because I always like to have case studies. Um, some of these, uh, uh, for example, Sarah mentioned the Pinterest one yesterday, where um, they saw, for example, a 15% increase in sign-up conversions when they made pages faster. Uh, BBC loses an additional 10% of users for every second it takes their site to load. Um, Financial Times reduced their load time to 1.5 seconds and increased user engagement by 30%. These are all website or, um, uh, stats and case studies you can find on WPO stats if you're interested in more. There's a lot of them there. So, yeah, slow websites and apps suck. Um, but then, how do you define slow? You know, we, we, we can say this intuitively because it feels, it feels right, it feels truthy. Um, but how do you define slow and how do you define suck? Um, I really love this quote by Steve Souders, and I'm not just putting this here because I work with Steve at Speed Curve. Um, I've been using this quote for a few years now because it's one of my favorite quotes. And what Steve said, or wrote, is that the real thing we're after is to create a user experience that people love and that they feel is fast. So we might be front end, front end engineers, we might be dev, we might be ops, we might be a lot of different things, but what we really are is perception brokers. So again, this brings us to, back to the point. How do we measure perception at scale? How do you take all these, uh, what you, people are actually feeling and thinking about how pages render and, and, and measure that in large volumes? And again, given the fact that, um, as Sarah and, and Bruce talked about yesterday, there are so many different user contexts. Um, w different environments where we're all tempor pr temporarily um, people with some type of disability, some type of motor function or visual disability, some kind of contextual issue um, with our bandwidth connection or our device running out of power or something like that. So how do we measure the, fa the perception when even our own perception is this fluctuating thing? It's a very fluid and dynamic thing and it changes throughout the day. It's okay to cry. <laughs> um, so if you've been in the performance space for a while, you're probably familiar with some, all, most of these different performance metrics. And what's really interesting about every metric that you can see up here is that at some point in time, they have all been conflated with user experience. 
some rightly, some wrongly. Um, and if you've ever, how many people here have used any of these metrics as, 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 as a user experience metric in a conversation? Yeah, me too. Um, and it turns out I was wrong sometimes, and that's okay. We're, you know, this, is, um, this is a journey. Uh, I was talking um, with some folks before, at uh, the beginning of this day, before we, we, I got up here, about the fact that I've given some type of metrics talk um, probably three or four times a year for the past three or four years, and it's always different because the metrics keep changing. What's really fascinating to me is the fact that the metrics, the, this, this rate of change is accelerating. We're, 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 we're moving really quickly towards something, and we're iterating really quickly on the metrics, and we're questioning the metri new metrics that are um, created and defined by different vendors and different browsers, and that's great. Um, some of the metrics that I'm going to uh, talk about today might be might disappear. They might be. They might seem valid today, but we'll find better metrics a year from now or two years from now. And I, I relish that. Um, and also, it's my job, so you know I need to keep working. Um, so I want to talk just about a few of these. I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, so load time. You know, again, how many people at some point in time have conflated load time with user experience? Definitely me. Um, but like nine or ten years ago, this was. This is kind of all we had. Um, early case studies around performance that were so important for galvanizing people and getting people to care were correlating load time with conversion or bounce rate or time on site or what have you. And that's, that's fine. It's what we had at the time. And it kind of worked back then because pages were different. Um, they had less stuff on them. Um, we didn't have progressive web apps yet. Um, things like that. So when pages were simpler, load time ki kind of worked. And in and to this day, even in really, really, if you have really large aggregated data sets, you can see that if you look at enough data, load time does correlate to um, changes and fluctuations in business metrics. And and so it's okay to kind of always have that in your in your back pocket as a metric to look at. But we know now that pages are way more complex um, and that go, you know, it's not the hill to die on if you are wanting to correlate something to user experience. This is not the one to do. We, can do, we know we can do much, much better. So Start Render came along. And actually, I just have the web page test logo up here. I think that um, you know, we owe this huge debt of gratitude to uh, tools like web page test and uh, browsers and uh, different companies for actually kind of going out on a limb and being the people to pioneer these metrics and uh, build them into their tools so that we can measure them and actually see how well they, they hold up in the real world. So this is a web page test metric. Um, it's been around for quite a while. Um, so hat tip to Pat Meenan for this. Um, so the time from the, the start of the initial navigation until the first non-white content is painted to the browser display. So it's a nice metric for seeing when something starts to render in the browser. Um, you know, something that you, you should definitely be paying attention to. But again, we know we can do still better. So speed index is the still better. So again, another hat tip to Pat Meenan for this one. So it's the average time at which the main visible parts of the page are displayed within the viewport. And so Pat um, launched this in web page test, I don't even know how many years ago, I, I lose track of time, but um, and it's great to, to see that it's been adopted by a lot of the different monitoring tools that are out there. So Speed Index, again, was um, Pat's best effort and the best, th and the best metric that was available for a long time to actually see well, when is the meaningful content on the page, most of the content on the page, actually visible in the browser. So knowing that load time wasn't cutting it. And same thing, visually complete is another great, uh, was another great metric that came along. So it's a time at which all the content in the viewport is rendered and nothing above the fold it visibly changes. Um, so again, a good metric, but the, the, let me see, okay. The problem that we run into is sometimes you can have all these great metrics that do great things, but depending on how the page is built, how your particular page is built, they don't mean anything. So looking at the metrics we just talked about, you can see <clears throat> that at 9.47 seconds, um, the page starts to render, but in the film strip view above that, that's showing you um, what you actually see at that point of time, 
you're not seeing actually meaningful content from the user's perspective. They don't particularly care that there's a little graphic up there in the top right corner of the screen. So start render, eh, as a user experience metric, not awesome. Page load, 38.08 seconds. Um, it's like way, way, way off the film strip. But you can see that at 12, point, at 12 seconds, actually the meaningful content above the, the fold has rendered. And here we have speed index over here at 57.85 seconds. So this is an example of a page that uh, where these metrics, all these, these, these uh, user experience metrics that we came up with to, uh, to, to, to figure out well, when are people actually meaningfully interacting with the page just don't work. They just don't work on this particular page. <clears throat> but it's okay. We'll get there. Um, so when coming up with a checklist of metrics that um, you should be looking at to measure user experience on your own site, on your own pages, this is the checklist that we have at SpeedCurve. Does it correlate to what users actually see in the browser? Is it easy to use? Is it accessible right out of the box? Can people, can people actually, like people like you, actually um, uh, measure your pages quickly and easily with it? Does it recognize that not all pixels and page elements are equal? And does it allow you to customize what you measure on specific pages, recognizing that all pages are different, all sites are different? So this is a checklist that we apply to any new metric that comes along. So now I want to talk about some emerging metrics that, have, um, that are the reason why I always have to update this deck and, and basically rebuild it every three to six months. Um, so first, contentful paint is, or contentful paint. I'm never sure how people pronounce that. Um, I just think like content, like it's happy, like you're happy because it's contentful. Um, it's very restful sort of, um, that's something else obviously, um, metric. <laughs> So it's the time when some type of contentful thing has, has painted in the browser on the first time. The problem is that it catches non-meaningful paints as well. So um, I can appreciate why it's used kind of as a, as a proxy for another metric that I'm about to talk about, first meaningful paint, but it's not, I just, I was about to say awesome. I'll say it, awesome. It's not awesome. So then we have first meaningful paint, which is being uh, fairly widely adopted, fairly widely touted. Um, we, um, we, we recently added it to uh, the metrics that we gather at Speed Curve, and we're just kind of watching it because it's interesting. Um, and one thing that I find interesting, just as, a, as, as an aside, is how we name metrics. I mean, you could do a whole t entire talk on the semantics of how we name metrics, because when you hear first contentful paint, it's like, or contentful paint, um, you, you think, oh, okay, content. I love content. Users love content. This must be a really great metric for users because it's about content. If you're a content strategist or somebody who's not a developer, first, uh, that, that would be uh, back in way at the beginning of my usability days, I would have gravitated towards that because I would have thought, oh, okay, it's about real content. Um, and obviously in the real world, not so much. First meaningful paint is even better. It's like, wow, it's meaningful. Great, I love meaning. Meaning is like the best. So um, it's a paint after which the biggest above the fold layout changes happened and your fonts have loaded. Again, a really, and you, I, I've, I don't know if anybody has, has caught this, I've linked to the docs where you can actually see the full spec that these definitions are coming from if you want to dig, dig deeper into these. Um, <clears throat> now, First meaningful paint is it's it's all right. I'm showing a, like a truncated waterfall here where you're seeing the the, the different metrics um, correlating with the different points on the timeline, and you can see first meaningful paint. Yeah, there's there's some stuff there. It could be meaningful. I don't know. Um, Time to first interactive um, is another one that um, people have uh, gravitated towards. Again example of a great name for a metric because the idea is that you want to know when people can actually engage with the page. But how do you define engagement is a really tricky thing. So this is um, a web page test metric um, that it has been embedded in a lot of different tools and we've added it to Speed Curve as well. Um, when the page is first expected to be usable and will respond quickly. So that's the de definition of interactive. However, do you know that people are interacting it, with it? I know from having sat in usability labs and watched people use pages, that people interact with, with pages very, very, very differently. 
um, older people and very young people will wait for everything on the page to render before they'll begin to interact with the page. More impatient people, like say people between the age of 20 and 55, 60, I don't know, um, will we'll, uh, start to click on stuff that like, okay, that looks close enough. I think this banner is gonna take me to, to what I need, or I can see the nav, so I'm gonna start interacting with the nav right away. So, um, so first interactive is really interesting because we're trying to put a label on something um, that, and they sort of pin down this sort of single thing when actually interactivity is this, is this moving target. So here you can see another waterfall, we're first interactive, 3.17 seconds. Um, and yeah, you know, it sort of maps to what you can see on the page, but you know, really, way back at three seconds, you could probably start to interact with the page. So it's a bit fluffy, it's a bit loose. Um, and uh, so just, uh, again, a reminder that um, what these metrics are measuring really, really is dependent on how the page itself is constructed. So thinking about the metrics we just looked at, um, we can check off a couple of boxes. What they do is they correlate to what people see in the browser, more or less. They're easy to use and accessible right out of the box because they're available in web page tests and probably any, um, any paid tools that you're already using. Um, what they don't do, however, is they don't recognize that all pixels and all elements on the page aren't equal, that some are more important than others from a user's perspective. And they don't let you really pinpoint the things that you care about, knowing your own site as well as you do. So um, everybody has their own sort of pet metrics. At Speed Curve, these are uh, new ones that we've revealed. You can go to um, this blog post and learn more about them. And um, but we call them hero rendering times. Um, and it's a very simple name because we're just talking about the hero elements on the page, hero elements that, that um, site owners have defined. And so they are synthetic metrics that measure um, when your first H1 tag renders, um, when the largest image on your page renders, or the largest background image, or both on the page, because some uh, sites use the uh, largest image uh, to, uh, for their hero image. Some don't have largest image, they, have, they, they use the background image tag, so uh, it kind of pulls all of those up. And this is what it looks like. So here you can see for the H1 render, um, you can see that, that that's the first H1 tag for this particular page. And the idea is that, especially for media sites, um, your first H1 tag usually uh, correlates to your headline or something like that. For um, retail sites, often it's, it's, uh, the H1 tag is used in uh, banner ads and things like that, and banner, just that kind of display copy. So, so it's, a, it's a pretty okay proxy for, for that, if, you, if that's something that matters to you and you know your own page well enough to know that the H1 tag is actually meaningful content for you. And the largest image render on this particular site happens to work because it's, it's grabbing the largest image. So again, it works okay. And then uh, largest background image, again here grabbing that, that background image. So you can see that it works well on these particular pages. So it checks a few things off the, off the box. Um, correlates to what people see in the browser. Um, it's easy to use and accessible because it's just sitting right there. And um, we're actually looking to add um, hero metrics to, and make them available so they can be used in other tools as well. And then recognizing that not all pixels are created the same. Actually trying to measure what, um, what the elements are that you care about. However, there's, they're not perfect. They're not going to allow you to customize what you measure on specific pages. So which metric is actually best? Like the, the, check, the, the checklist that I just uh, showed you, you know, it, you know, checking three out of four boxes was, was okay. Um, but putting this actually to the test out in the real world on a variety of different sites is kind of where we can, we can um, see how, how well things hold up. So we did this, and this is actually, you can go to this URL right now, lab.speedcurve.com slash rendering slash picker dot php, and you can actually do this. This is a visual test, and I would love it if people did it, actually, and, and, and you can, down there in the corner, at me, Tam Everts, and let me know what your score was. What it is, is we took the top 100 sites, um, I believe according to the HTB archive, and this is only showing the top, top three, but you actually can uh, pick 
the, the frame, and this is just a film strip view of each page's full render, and you can pick the frame that you, where you feel, personally, in your own very important opinion, um, that the page has rendered and become usable. So when would you begin to interact with a page? And you, um, at the very bottom, after you've done all 100 pages, you'll get your score, um, and, you'll, and you'll see which were the metrics that actually mattered to you on these particular pages. How did they, how did they rank? So we did this ourselves and, and amongst a whole bunch of uh, kind of beta testers of this particular tool. And again, bearing in mind that this is, this is, I'm not trying to say that this is any kind of scientific research or anything like that. I just want to go <laughs> come right out and say that. This was um, uh, it's somewhere between research and kind of anecdotal, um, anecdotal information. But we had you know, a lot of people who care about performance and are experienced in this space do this. And the winners in the, within that group, uh, the winner of, of, of which was the best metric was you probably saw that coming. <laughs> I'm always very suspicious when anybody tells me, like, here it is. There's, yeah. Um, it really, really depends on what you, on what you care about. So, for delivering any content on the page, we found start render was the best metric. For delivering a significant amount of content, speed indexed and first meaningful paint. For delivering critical content, it was the hero rendering times. And the hero rendering times were actually, just, we, we um, ag aggregated all of the, the, the hero, different hero metrics, and that's how we came up with that. So it really, really depends. And you can get six very smart people, or eight or 12, or you know, keep inflating that number, um, in a room looking at the same page and the same set of metrics and probably come away with six or 12 or whatever uh, different conclusions about what it actually means. Um, we wrote a blog post about it, Steve wrote a post, um, where we, we talk about rendering metrics and the results of this and, um, and some things that you can take away and apply to your own thinking and your own processes for determining um, how to proceed with, with figuring out your own best metrics. Really, the best metrics are custom metrics. Um, I can't say this often enough. We feel that every site should be measuring their own custom metrics. Um, you can learn more about how to do that. I, I've attached a couple of links here. But basically, what, what custom metrics let you do? Actually, quick show of hands. How many people in this room are using or have used custom metrics on a site? OK, that's interesting. Um, I'll tell you why in a, sec in a second. Um, so basically, you're measuring when the, a, a specific page element is uh, rendered by having marks and measures at the beginning and end of that element on the page. Um, so kind of like this. You want to know how long does it take to display the main product image on your site. Um, I love hearing case studies from different companies that have uh, developed their own custom metrics. So, you know, one of the first ones that, that I was familiar with that was on my radar was Twitter's time to first tweet. Um, yesterday, um, you heard Sarah talk about uh, pinner wait time, which is a great metric. Um, and then cars.com uh, did a time to interact, their own custom time to interact. Um, so just uh, companies that actually know their own sites and know their own pages and actually know what they want to measure and then label your own metrics, um, is, it's just really, really heartening to hear that companies are doing this. If you actually um, go online and Google any of these metrics, any of these company names, you will find case studies from them where they actually are explaining how they did this. And um, it's just a great example of you know, this community sharing information and best practices um, amongst ourselves. So this is why I wanted the show of hands earlier. What we found looking at the HTTP archive is that actually only 15% of sites uh, use custom metrics, and other 85% of sites don't. And the reason they don't is because it's actually kind of hard. It's, um, it's doable, and the people who are doing it will tell you, yeah, it's, you, know, you get into a cadence of doing it, and, it's, um, and it just becomes part of, of how, you do, how you do things, but it requires ongoing work. Your, 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 your um, custom metrics change. You have to um, remove. T you have to remove the marks and measures and move things around. And you have to constantly educate people about what the new metrics are. And you have to look, continue to learn about your site and learn about your pages. You can't just sort of sit in. Um, 
you know, your, 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 your performance engineering bunker um, and pretend that the actual site itself doesn't matter, not that I'm accusing anybody in this room of doing that, um, you have to actually know the site and you have to communicate with marketing and sales and other people in the org on the dev and design teams to actually understand what are the elements that they care about, whether it's ads or call to action buttons or hero images or anything else that they need to track because they want to track those as success metrics for themselves because they know that those metrics correlate to business metrics. And that's the other great thing. Once you've uh, found the page rendering metric that actually means something for user experience, you can then start correlating that to all your other business metrics like bounce rate or conversion rate or time on site and so on. So for custom metrics, it correlates to what people see in the browser, yay. It recognizes that not all pixels and elements are created the same also yay, and it allows you to measure what you, uh, what you want on specific pages, but not necessarily easy to use, not necessarily accessible. There's a learning curve involved. Um, but on the positive side, instead of having just one unicorn, you get a whole herd of unicorns. You get to make your own unicorn. Um, and just fun fact, I did not know until I started putting this deck together that a herd of unicorns is called a blessing. So now you know that. Um, and you can share that with people on your teams as well. Um, so what next? So it starts with knowing the most meaningful metrics for your site, for your pages that matter to your users. You want to track them, ideally with synthetic and RUM, because synthetic um, lets you do a lot of great things. RUM lets you do other things. If you're just using one without the other, then you're kind of getting this view or this view, but you're not getting this view, and you really need that view. Um, uh, so you want to track them over time. And people touched on this yesterday, and I can't stress this enough. Don't focus on averages or medians. Um, you want to look at your 90th percentiles, but you also want to look at your 10th percentile. What are the best performing pages on your, on your, on your site? What are they like? What are the best experience on, the, on your site? What are they like? Um, so focusing on, uh, so looking at those, um, you can't even call them outliers. It's 10% uh, of your, of your uh, audience is a lot of people. If you have a million page views a day, or sorry, a million visitors a day, that's 100,000 users that you need, that you're, you're kind of leaving out in the cold if you're ignoring that 90th percentile. Um, so you really need to look at that. And then set goals. Um, I really love something that Tobias uh, Baldoff uh, wrote and published yesterday release, and he's going to be talking later today about um, uh, performance monitoring at Trivago, about performance budgets, where it's great to set goals for things like different page rendering metrics and page size metrics and um, uh, measuring how, uh, how much of your page weight is due to images and what have you. Um, but not just seeing it as, uh, as, oh no, we can't exceed this goal or we'll get our hands slapped by our alerts, but actually seeing it as a, as a budget. Like, what can we do in this amount of space and in the same way that you would approach any other budget? Um, make yourself accountable. Make sure that you're getting alerts and that you're sharing results with your team and that you are actually um, holding yourself accountable for the goals and the targets that you set and staying true to your metrics. And be very, very mindful of regressions. That's probably, you know, the, the, the biggest thing I hear about is people doing these big performance sprints that last six, 10, eight weeks, and they make these amazing improvements and have these awesome case studies. And then six months, a year later, their charts go from like this to like this as the numbers start to creep up again. It's ridiculously common um, and, really, and, re and a really difficult um, challenge to tackle if you don't have a dedicated performance team. But um, as, again, the, the folks at Pinterest uh, shared yesterday, three people is a team. So uh, you know, a team can be one person. It can be three people. It doesn't have to be this massive um, enterprise level, you know, 50 person thing with uh, its own, its own uh, war room or anything like that. So again, why should you care um, if you don't care already? Um, you should care because even if you have, uh, you're sitting there right now, you, you, you have no disabilities. You are always in an urban setting with really snappy uh, Wi-Fi or you know, some crazy new next generation connection, um, some, anything like that. Um, one thing that we all have in common is that we're all getting older. Um, it's going to happen. I'm sorry if I'm 
the first one to tell you this. Um, how many people here over the age of 25? So great, okay, so your cognitive ability has already declined like quite a bit. <laughs> Um, almost 1% a year, yay. Um, your ability to use the web declines by almost 1% a year. That's uh, basically your, your, uh, your, your, your tactile awareness, your, 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 your motor skills, your visual acuity, all of these things are just, it's just, a, just downhill all the way. And so you're designing for yourself. You basically, we're, 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 we're torchbearers. We're, we're creating a better web today and trying to create these patterns today of thinking about users and, and having user-centered uh, performance practices. Because someday, no matter where you are right now, you're going to be that person who's squinting at their, their whatever we're using in the future and, um, and just trying to get the damn thing to work uh, quickly because, you know, you've got to get to a shuffleboard tournament or what have you. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess that's, that's it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, or if you don't do Twitter, you can email me directly. This is my actual email address, not just a dummy account that I put on slides um, that I never respond to. You will get a response. Um, and yeah, I, I'm around here for the rest of the day if anyone would like to chat. Thank you. Thank you.